And amen. You may be seated. Give the Lord a clap. Praise this morning. What an incredible time of worship. Thank you, Joey. Thank you, Miss Abby. Thank you, team, for all that you do in leading us. And Joey, thank you. And I echo what Brother Bob says. It is just a joy to watch you lead worship because you lead from a heart that is truly worshiping. And we are grateful for that. And thank you this morning. And I am saddened that today will be your last day with us as you move to California. We just now got you in a tie, my friend. We just now got him in a tie. But the Lord is using him mightily all over the United States and all over the world. So again, thank you, Joey, for all that you do. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to the book of 1 Peter. The book of 1 Peter. And I want us to look at chapter 1, verses 1 through 9 this morning. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, as we continue on in our sermon series entitled Read 66. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been traveling through the Bible. Now our journey is almost to a close as we're just a few weeks away from the last time that I'll give this formal introduction. But in the meanwhile, we've been on a journey traveling through the Bible. And literally as we preach the Bible from cover to cover, as we teach the Bible from cover to cover, literally as we're reading together the Bible from cover to cover, we're unfolding the unparalleled and unprecedented truths of the Word of God. We're allowing them to permeate who we are and move on us and literally change us from the inside out. Just like that old Route 66 a care person from east to west. Friends, I want you to know as we've been reading the Bible, we've not been moving from east to west. The Bible has been moving us from death unto life. I said death unto life. First Peter chapter 1 beginning in verse 1 going down to verse 9. As we give thought this morning to a sermon that I've entitled, Benefits of Believing. Benefits of Believing. As you're turning to 1 Peter chapter 1, I want you to understand that in our life, we're always looking for those things to which benefit our life. Sometimes it's unhealthy, and I don't have time to preach about that. But for the most part, our pursuit of benefits, our pursuit of, the, uh, our pursuit of those things that will, uh, that, that will bring some extras into our life is a healthy pursuit. And it can be in so many regards of our life. When we think about benefits, oftentimes, and I like to define benefits as those extras that come as a, uh, and, and, and literally move beyond expectation. Let me give you a Freeman definition of benefits, all right? And that is uh, those extras that move beyond our expectation. And we find those in so many regards of our life. Think about when you're looking for a job, what do you do? Not only are you evaluating what they're going to pay you, amen, because that's important, amen? Is anybody here this morning? Is it Labor Day this morning? And you're here at the early service this morning. <laughs> you got some plans this afternoon. Here, I'm going to get you out if you'll begin to listen quicker. Amen. All right, so here's the deal. I mean, when you're looking for that job, not only are you looking at that compensation rate, but you're also looking at the benefit package. You want to know what those extras that are moving beyond just the compensation, moving beyond just the expectation. But here's what I want you to understand today. Look at me for just a minute. When it comes to just about every regard of our physical life, we can experience some benefits of one kind or another. But I want you to know that they transcend not only our physical life, but they move really into our spiritual life. There is some spiritual benefits that come as a result of our salvation. That's what I want to talk about today. First Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, going down. To verse 9, I want to take just a moment if I can to set up where we are in this passage of Scripture. We're reading a letter from Peter. You know Peter. You recognize Peter. Peter is one of the most boisterous leaders of all the disciples. And he went on to be one of the greatest leaders of the early church. One of the greatest leaders of the first century. And here we find, we pick up, and Peter is writing a letter. And he's writing a circular letter to those churches in Asia Minor, those churches that Paul planted on those missionary journeys that we spent so much time talking about. And hear this letter, in Peter's letter. Now this is why he's the, one of the most incredible leaders that have ever lived. Because in this letter, Peter begins, and, and he begins his letter with such an encouragement, such 
a faith strengthener for the church, if you will, for all of those churches. That the very first thing that he unfolded was just a stark reminder. Sometimes we need to be reminded of who we are and whose we are. Amen? Hey, sometimes we just need to be reminded. We were reminded this morning in song that we are a child of God. As many as received Him, He gave the right to become children of God. Here Peter is reminding them literally, really, what it means to be a child of God. And all of those, can I call them friends this morning? All of those friends' benefits that come as a result of being saved. First Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 1, going down to verse 9. Stand, if you would, this morning for the reading of the Word of God. And this morning, as we look at this passage of Scripture, I want us to see eight benefits. Some of y'all are like, Pastor, we thought we was getting out early. <laughs> Think again. Eight benefits. Now here's what's going to happen today. Joey, I know you're leaving, so you, you can do this today. I mean, it's going to be good. And then Brother Drake, you're, no, I got to get somebody bigger than you. Stronger. I got to get some of Alan. This is your, your own duty today, all right? Here's what I need on either side. Today, if I'm going to get through eight points, when I start this way, all you got to do is stand up. Joey, are you ready? If I come down this way, I'll, and if I hit that stair right there, all you got to do is stand up, all right? That's going to remind me that I can't go this way. I'm not going that way. I'll break my neck. And if I come down here, I'm going to have Alan and he'll break my neck. So, I mean, this is what we're going to do today to keep the pastor on track. Because when I get down here, because listen, when I get, you're not doing good. Thank you, Alan. That's a little test. When I get down here, down what I call the centers and the tax collector select uh, section, you know, I mean, I'm just liable to camp out a while. But we got to hasten on this morning if we're going to get through eight points. Amen. But listen, look at me. Just because I ain't down there today, don't know if, uh, don't, don't think I don't know if you're sleeping or not. And if you are, I can see you. And now I can see you. And I'm going to call on you to pray. Amen. Just, just straight up call. All right. We ready today? Eight benefits that are bestowed upon us as believers. In other words, eight benefits this morning of the saved life. Can I go ahead and jump to the end? <laughs> that was quick, wasn't it? Here's, here's what I... If you're here today and you're saved... I want this message today to absolutely strengthen you and encourage you in your next leg of the journey. I want you to, because there's a whole lot of, sa look at me, there's a whole lot of saved people, even in this room, that you're not living like a saved person. You're living in the shackles and imprisonment of everything that the enemy wants to throw. You're living and, 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 and being dictated daily by the circumstances of this life. And friend, I'm going to teach you today what the benefit of being a child of God is. And I want you and us to live that out today. If you're here today and you've never been saved, I pray you'd hear these benefits. And you, there's no way if you hear the benefit package. Come on, look at me. You're like, there's no way when you hear the benefit package over there when they're going to pay you insurance, they're going to give you some vacation time, they're going to give you some comp time, and they're going to pay you and give you a check. There's no way you can say no. When I tell you these benefits of being a believer, there's no way, hopefully and prayerfully, that you would ever say no to what God is offering you today. Eight benefits that are bestowed upon us as believers. Beginning in verse 1, Peter, <clears throat> an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus and Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia and, Bith uh, Asia and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, and led to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. May grace and peace be yours to the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again into a living home through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, and will not fade away, and is reserved, stored up in heaven for you. 
You who are protected by the power of God through your faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this, greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. But that's to prove your faith. And your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you've not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but you believe you have faith in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory obtaining as the outcome of, the, of your faith the salvation of your very soul. Father, don't let us turn down any of these benefits. And Father, when you unfold them for us today, any aspect of these benefits that we're not experiencing and we're not partaking of, Father, let us move in that direction. Free us up today. And there's one, perhaps many, but I just believe there's one in this room never been saved. And therefore, they've never experienced these benefits. And their life looks quite different, quite contrary to what I'm preaching from your word today. So move me out of the way and you preach. And draw us near. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Y'all ready? Alan, you ready? Joey, you ready? First benefit out of eight benefits. The first benefit that's bestowed upon believers is the fact that when a person accepts Jesus Christ, when a person gives their life to the fact that God has given His life for us, when a person gets saved, they receive God's grace. God's grace. Look at verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled in His blood, may grace be yours until the fullest measure. Friends, I want you to know one of the greatest resources, one of the greatest benefits of the saved life is the fact that when a person gets saved, when a person believes what the Bible says, that Jesus Christ died on that old rugged cross when He was buried, I'm testing you, when He was buried and then He got up from the dead on the third day, Jesus got straight up from the dead, amen? And the Bible says that if we'll believe that, that's the gospel message, and the gospel is the power of God of salvation for every single person who's willing to believe. And friend, when we believe, one of the first aspects, one of the first things that comes as a result of our salvation is the grace of God on our life. It's important to understand what grace is. Oftentimes we define it as God's unmerited favor. And that's a great definition, but it goes beyond that. It moves deeper than that. Even when we think about the word grace itself. The word grace itself in the original language is the word charis. And it literally defines as this. You ready? Grace, charis, is that which affords joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, and loveliness. You want me to say that again? Because I'm telling you, this is what you get when Jesus takes up residence in your life. This is what He brings in. Joy, pleasure, delight, sweetness, charm, and loveliness. Doesn't that sound good this morning? Oh, come on, what a benefit. I'm just on number one. We got seven more to go. But Jesus, when He comes in, He brings in things like joy. We talked about joy this morning in our, in our worship time. But when you think about joy, now there's a big difference between joy and happiness. Oftentimes we get this confused and oftentimes we use it uh, synonymously, but I want you to understand that uh, joy and happiness is two different things. I've told you this before. Joy, I'll take you back on the English lesson. Joy is a noun. You know what a noun is? A person, place, or thing. That means that joy is something that you get. It's a tangible object that becomes a part of your life. This is how it works. When Jesus comes in, He brings in, you're overcome with the grace of God, but when Jesus takes up residence in our life through the person of the Holy Spirit of God, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, then what He brings with Him, one of the aspects of that is joy. 
It's a tangible object. It's, some, it's something that abides. I like to define joy as abiding contentment in your life. Write that down. That's good. Write it down. Abiding contentment for your life. And joy overcoming. I mean, there's nothing. It's unfathomable to think about how it works. And listen to me. It's unshakable in the, produ- in the results that it produces for our life. I mean to tell you it's incredible to think about joy that abiding contentment taking up residence in your life is so much different than happiness. When you think about happy, happy is what? Happy is an adjective. See, I'm giving y'all English. Like, y'all should have studied more in school. Amen? Come on, y'all. I mean, because you know, I mean, English is my strong point. <laughs> but adjective, it's a descriptive word. It's, it describes something. It really describes how you feel. I mean, it's, it's describing your emotion, and emotion is always driven by circumstance. See, this is what joy, joy is abiding contentment, whereas happiness can come and go based on the circumstances. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, this was so illustrated in my own life on August 21st, 2019, just a couple of weeks ago, a week and a half or so ago, all right? Because I want you to know the circumstances often dictate. If, if circumstances are good, you're happy. If circumstances are bad, you're not. Come on, I mean, that's just plain as I can get it. Do y'all understand that? Do I need to get down there? Because I can run past Joey. I mean, here, here's the thing. When circumstances are good, Brother Bob, I mean, you're happy when they're bad. You, I mean, you're, you're sad, you're angry. I mean, it's just full of emotion. But those emotions come and go, and they're dictated by the circumstance. August 21st, 2019, a day that will live in infamy. A day in the life of Grace Baptist Church, one of the darkest days for not only the ministry of Grace Baptist Church, but really the ministry of your pastor. The day that the State Department came in to Grace Baptist Academy and they said you can no longer operate, send these students home, you are in violation of, and you are operating in illegal daycare. Amen. Hey, listen, ain't nothing holding on in the gizzard when something happens like that. I mean, you can just, I mean, it, it's just going to be, you're going to get a cleansing. But they come in and they say, you can't, offer, you got to send these students home. And there, I want you to understand, those were difficult circumstances. See, they said, we, Brother Drake was operating in illegal daycare. I thought we had a school. Amen. And that was the trajectory that we were going on. And somehow, some way, things got crossed up and it wound up by inadvertently, by mistake. I mean, we had a situation. Houston, we had a problem. And I want you to understand, that was a difficult circumstance that day. And circumstances often dictate emotion. And I want you to understand that based on that difficult circumstance, there wasn't a good emotion. <laughs> I want you to understand, let me put it like this. That was a day that your pastor wasn't too happy. That's the first time in 11 years, I think, Brother Drake, that anybody from this congregation asked me, said, Pastor, how you doing? I said, I'm okay. And most of the time, I'm doing great. But listen, sometimes difficult circumstances. See, this is the difference. But you want me to tell you what the difference was and how things turned out? You want me to tell you the difference was in August 21st, 2019, that Wednesday when they came in, 1152, sent the students home? You want to know how the rest of the day operated and how you passed, even in the difficult circumstances? See, this is the difference between, uh, this is the difference between happy as an adjective and abiding contentment and joy. As a child of God, you won't know what happened the rest of the day. Same thing that happens every Wednesday. We made it through the rest of the day. Obviously, I spent a little extra time working on some things, okay? But when it came church time, because that's the day that you come. That's the day set apart that you can come and we pour into your life and disciple and teach you to observe all that I've commanded you. So I got ready and then I... Uh, prepared and went and taught my class just like I normally do. You know why? Because circumstances dictate emotion, but they don't, listen, they don't override the joy that you have in the abiding contentment. It's the abiding contentment that moves you through those circumstances. I went, came, taught my class. You know what else I did? Went home from church, went and had the normal con- conversation with my wife. You know what else I did? I went to bed. You know what else I did? Slept like a baby. Come on. 
Slept all night. Well, at least five hours. That's what all night to me. When I mean slept, like a baby, got up the next morning. You know what I did? Same thing I do every Thursday morning. I got up, put my clothes on, put the Word of God on. Come on, clothe myself in the power and the anointing of God. Got up, drove to work, came to work, lived my life as a normal day. You know why? Because circumstances will dictate how you feel. And how you feel oftentimes drives what you do. But this is what joy does. See, this is what, when the presence of God comes in and joy comes in, friends, the devil, then those circumstances will tell you, try to have you curled up in a fetal position, tell you ain't no sense of going. It's all over. Then they'll shut the school down. Then they'll shut the ministry of Grace Baptist. They done ruined the reputation of Grace Baptist. You know what I did? Got up, put my clothes on, said, not today, devil. Not today. You know why? Because I got a bad and contentment and joy that moved in my life on May 1st, 1994 when I got saved. Oh, I wish I had time this morning to go through the rest of these benefits. They're just as good. But joy. There's a difference between joy and happiness. You're not going to be happy all the time as a child of God. But you got joy. And joy drives the action of our life. The second benefit I want to share with you, the second benefit that's bestowed upon us as believers is the fact that when a person accepts Jesus Christ, they receive prevailing peace. Prevailing peace. Look at verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood, may grace and peace... Be yours to the fullest measure. Oh, friend, doesn't it sound good to have a little peace in our life? Huh? Doesn't it sound good this morning? Just a little peace that surrounds our life. Oh, how many of you got kids? You know you just want a little peace in your life. I'm not going. I'm just getting me some water. Just let me get some water. Y'all done preached me to death on the first point. I got six more after this one. I got to hasten on. Y'all not doing very good as my bodyguards here. I figured out I can preach just as long up here as I can down there, can't I? Doesn't it sound good to have a little thought about a little peace? But we've got to understand what biblical peace is and in terms or in uh, comparison to what we think peace is from an earthly or a physical standpoint. You see, when we think about peace, we think about the absence of of conflict, but I want you to understand that biblical peace is much different. The word peace is the word irene, and it literally means to be exempt from the havoc of war. Write that down. It literally translates, it means to be exempt from the havoc of war. It doesn't say that we're going to be exempt from war. See, that's what our idea of peace is. But, but it's not an absence of conflict. It's not an absence of war. We know in the Christian life that we're full-fledged up in a war. A spiritual war, as Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12 says. As 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 reminds us, we got an adversary that wants to destroy our life. Disrupt, destruct, and destroy our life. But friend, we're engaged in a war, but as a a child of God. This is what you get as a benefit of being saved. Hey, hey, are you listening? You get exempt from the havoc of war. Now you're going to be engaged in the battle. You're going to be engaged in the war. But friend, what this means is we don't have to get caught up in the wake and destruction of the war because what's different between the earthly and physical wars and the spiritual war, and earthly and physical are decided after the war is over. But I want you to know in the spiritual realm, it's already been decided in the midst of the war who the victory is. Huh? I want you to already understand that the outcome has already been declared. When Jesus Christ got up from the dead, He won it all. And for those who are on Jesus' team, you're involved in a war that's already been won. Doesn't that sound exciting? Because you can live differently. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, think about it. When you're in the heat of a battle, if you already knew the outcome, think about it. See, yesterday was football season in the world. In the state of Tennessee. But in the world. But football began yesterday. Eh? 
And there was a lot, but in every game, look at me for a minute, think about this. In every game, there was a winner and there was a loser. There was no game that tied yesterday and ended in a tie. Am I right on that? I got the right sport and the right outcomes, right? Every game was decided by a winner and a loser. But can you, can you imagine? Can you imagine when them boys from Georgia State, I mean, can you imagine? Come on, let me stay here. Can you imagine when, can you imagine those teams who were victorious yesterday? If they knew the outcome of the game, if it had already been declared the outcome of the game before the game even started, how much differently they would have played. They could have played with great confidence. And that doesn't mean that you lose any luster in the game. That doesn't mean that you intensify. But you can play with a greater confidence. If you already know that you want, you may even play with a greater strength and capacity than you would if you're trying to scratch out to win. Sometimes you can get the wind blown out of yourself. Sometimes you can get defeated because it just doesn't seem like you can scratch it out. But I want you to know, when the victory's already been declared, you can play the game differently. So, in the game of life, in our spiritual life, I want you to understand that we can play, we can live this life differently because the outcome has already been decided. No matter what comes your way, the outcome has already been decided. Victory has already been declared. And for those on Jesus' team, now if you're not on Jesus' team, none of these benefits pertain. I hope you'll listen intently today to understand how different our lives are as a result of being saved. A third or fourth benefit that's bestowed upon believers is the fact that when a person accepts Jesus, they receive concrete certainty. Concrete certainty. Let me go back to the third. Say I got so many I can't even keep up. Y'all want me to go to the third or just skip it? Come on, are y'all involved in this or not? I'm, I'm, I'm giving y'all, all right, we're going to the third. Third benefit. Third benefit bestowed upon believers is the fact, I thought I was farther ahead, Joey. You got to help me. I thought I was further ahead. Third benefit. As bestowed upon believers is the fact that when a person accepts Jesus, they receive a supernatural start. A supernatural start. The Bible says in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again. Oh, friend, think about this. Oh, can, can we just, I'm glad we didn't skip this, and this is one of my favorite ones right here. Can you imagine thinking about being born again and what that means for the Christian life? This is what it means. Have you ever, has anybody ever asked you this question? If you could do, here's the question. If you could do life all over again, would you do it differently? Hey, let me ask you that. If you could do life all over again, is there some things that you would do differently? And I think all of us would attest that the answer to that question is yes. But you know what the beautiful benefit of uh, of being a believer, the benefit of salvation is the fact that you can answer that question and actually do it. Do you know that being uh, a saved, uh, being born again allows you the opportunity to redo life. You can restart, relaunch, relive life all over again. The Bible said when a person gets saved that all of our sins are wiped away. Cast as far as the east is from the west. Everything that we've ever messed up in our life is now gone. We get a clean state, a clean slate. I like to talk about the fact that when Jesus comes in and takes residence, He brings in a brand new heart and a brand new start. You get to do everything. Can you imagine? You get to reparent again. Oh, friend, if you could go back and parent again, would you do some things differently this time? Come on. But the beauty of it is it doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, how many mistakes you made, do you realize that when you get saved, you get the opportunity to reparent all over again. And you get to parent through the eyes of the Bible. You get to parent through the divine instruction of God Almighty. Oh, you get to re-employ again. Can you imagine that? I mean, maybe today that sounds good to you because you've not been the best employee at your corporation or your company. I, I believe that Christians, and more specifically, I can't do anything about the rest of them, but Grace Baptist Church Christians, 
I think we ought to be the best employees that our company has ever hired in the history of their company. I believe that you ought to be on spot on every aspect of what you do. And I think that it goes more than just a fair day's way for a fair day's pay. I believe that we got a movement around the Colossians chapter 3, verse 23 and 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as for the Lord rather than for me. I think you ought to be the best that your company's ever seen. Maybe that's not been your lot in life. Maybe that's not how you've been an employee. You know what? When you get saved, you get to do it all over again. Doesn't matter how long you've been there either. You get to go in with a brand new heart. Brand new start. You get to relive life. I mean, maybe you made some mistakes in your health life. Maybe you made some mistakes in your emotional life. Maybe you made some uh, mistakes in your, in, in, your, in your spiritual life. Maybe you made some mistakes in your financial life. You know, you get a redo in all of these. Maybe, maybe if you go back and relive your life financially, you'd make a lot of different decisions. Guess what? You can And this time you get to spend money under the power of God and understanding that everything that God has given to you, the resource He's given is just given to you to manage. They're not yours to keep. And the better you manage them, the more resources He pulls and pours into your life. That's a word for somebody this morning. You get to redo it. This is what... The supernatural starts all about. You get to go back to a starting point. A fourth benefit is bestowed upon believers is the fact that when a person accepts Jesus, they receive concrete certainty. Blessed be the God of our Father and Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercies caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Oh, friends, this is one of the greatest aspects of of the benefits that Peter's describing here. When a person gets saved, we don't just have hope. We get a living hope. I mean, we get a living hope. And this is much different than the hope that we know of in the language that we use every day. Hope that we talk about has no certainty. It's just, I mean, it's, it's brought about by luck or chance. And that's how we describe hope. But I'm talking about biblical hope this morning. I'm talking about a living hope. And literally, it, trans, it translates a firm conviction or what I'm calling today concrete It's a concrete conviction. It's a concrete, ladies and gentlemen, certainty. We get to understand today that everything that the Bible's talking about, everything as it pertains to our earth, our eternal life, is concrete certainty to our life. We don't have to guess and wonder. So many times, think about this. So many times, I'll ask a person, hey, Listen, if you were to die today, do you, and, and, and today was your last day, would you spend eternity in heaven? You know what most people say? Not only outside the church, but inside the church. You know what most people say? Look at me. I sure hope so. I should, friend, understand this. It's an undeniable and unchangeable fact that if you've given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've been bought by the precious blood that was spilled at Calvary, I want you to understand today it's no longer a hope so when it comes to any part of your eternity. It's no longer a hope so when it comes to any part of these spiritual benefits. I want you to understand today if you're a child of God, it's not a hope so, it's a no so. Hey! It's not a hope so, it's a no so. These things I write unto you who believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you may know that you have eternal life. All of these things are written for our benefit. Friend, I want you to know it's a concrete certainty when it comes to being saved. The fifth benefit that is bestowed upon believers is the fact that when a person accepts Jesus Christ, they receive an immeasurable inheritance. I said an immeasurable inheritance. To obtain an inheritance, verse 4, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, it's reserved in heaven for you. Have you ever thought about an inheritance? Now look at me for a minute. Alan, be ready because I'm getting ready to come down here. 
I'm going to stop right here. You're good. You're good. I want you to walk with me for just a minute. Think about an inheritance. You know inheritance is a good, amen? And the Bible says that we are leaving inheritance for our children. The Bible says you're worse than an infidel if you don't take care of your family, even after you're gone. It's our responsibility. I believe that pertains to the kingdom of God as well. I think you ought to take care of the kingdom of God beyond your passing. You ought, to, you ought to leave some money for the kingdom. You ought to leave some money in the down. You ought to leave some money to the church. You ought to leave some money to some Christian schools. You ought to. And this moves beyond you and affects eternity for other people even after you're gone. But here's the thing. Think about an inheritance, right? And how much confidence that that gives us. Let's take this hypothetical situation. Let's say that you've got a rich uncle. Let's say you've got a rich relative. And in the wake of that uh, rich relative, he has made a proclamation to the family that when he dies, his estate's going to be divided in equal parts across the family divide. Which means that one day, out in the future, you stand to inherit, if you will, to get a pretty sizable chunk of resources. Now, doesn't that sound good for just a minute? But let me tell you what that does for our life. Because maybe you're like everybody else, and you're just scratching out something every day as far as a living. You're going to work every day. I mean, you're doing everything you can to put clothes on the backs and food on the table. I mean, you're just scratching it out, and you're here, and you're there, and you're week to week, and month to month, and hand to mouth. You're doing everything you can just to make ends meet and make everything come together, just to keep the family together. You're searching for coins in the couch. Come on, put a little gas up in the car. Y'all been there before? I mean, and maybe this is where you are. But knowing that one day, oh friend, one day, knowing that one day, see you can live differently if you know that one day. Now I'm not talking about living irresponsibly because sometimes people know this and they get irresponsible. They count the chickens before they hatch. Come on, they get the cart before the horse and they'll go out here and spend this inheritance. That's the irresponsible living. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about one day. One day, praise God, those couch change, couch days are almost over. One day, things are going to be so much different than the handmail. One day. And that's one day we get that we're going to scratch it out now. But one day, things are going to be so much different for our lives and even the future of our family. Friend, that's how it works in our spiritual life. If you think about this immeasurable inheritance, I wish I had time, but one day, here's the thing, we may be scratching it out down here, we may be hand to mouth, going week to week, month to month, we may be, I'm not even talking about money, I'm just talking about living life, and the decisions that we got to make thereof. But friend, one day, one day, it's all going to be a one day, we're going to get those new bodies. One day, we're going to get those new houses. One day, we're going to get them new jobs in heaven. One day, we're going to get that new boss, praise the God. I mean, one day. Oh, as a child of God, we got an immeasurable inheritance. And that ought to give us the confidence to scratch out no matter what comes into our life, no matter what feels. I want... Mm, one day, a sixth benefit is bestowed upon believers is the fact that when a person accepts Jesus, they get perfect protection. Perfect protection. The Bible says in verse 5, Peter's letter, who are protected by the power of God through their faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Protected by the power of God. Friend, do you know that when we get saved, we get a supernatural, we get a perfect perfection. I wish I had time this morning to take you over to Job chapter 1 and tell you how all this thing works, how God puts a hedge of protection and there's nothing that, that anybody, any circumstance comes into your life that does not filter through the hand of God. Come on, you listening to me? I mean, there's nothing you're going through, nothing you went through last year, nothing you went through last week, nothing you're experiencing today, and nothing you'll face tomorrow that does not first filter through the hand of God. And nothing can come into your life until He lets it come. For some of you today, that brings great concern. That brings great question. And why would God allow something like this to happen to my life? But friends, for all of us, it ought to bring great comfort. 
Oh, it ought to bring great comfort. You know why? Because if God brought it, hey, look, look at me. If God brung it, God's got it. <laughs> Woo! Have mercy. If God brung it, that means God got it. He's going to take care of it. He's going to navigate you through all these other, I mean through the charis, through the supernaturals. I mean all of these other benefits are going to carry you right through that circumstance. You know why? Because the Bible says He'll never leave you nor forsake you. If God brought it, God's going to take care of it. He's got a perfect protection on your life. A seventh benefit bestowed upon believers is the fact that when a person come, when a person accepts Jesus, they receive continual celebration. Look at this. Verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. Even now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you've not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but you believe, you greatly rejoice with inexpressible in who we are in Christ Jesus. Oh, friends, I want you to know how powerful that is to understand what we've been given as a benefit. Continual celebration. We have so much to celebrate. Peter was reminding them. And he got a little bit something. That's why Peter, I knew Peter listened to his pastor. His pastor was James, the half-brother of Jesus, who was also a pastor of the church of Jerusalem. That was Peter's pastor, right? Y'all listening to me? And he, he learned something about this circumstance. Life is tough, amen? It was tough in our day. It was tough in Peter's day. It's a whole lot tougher then. You know why? Because those folks back in Peter's day getting their heads cut off for being a Christian. All y'all got to deal with in Christians sometimes when the church is too cold or too hot. Maybe the pews aren't sitting just right. Aggravating a hemorrhoid or something. That's about the only persecution we got. Come on. It was tough back then, but still life is tough now. But you know what, friends? Peter's reminding all of them that we have so much to celebrate. We've got so much to celebrate. We've got so much celebration and rejoicing no matter what we're going through. Because you know what James taught Peter? Consider it all joy, brother, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And endurance, uh, let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be made perfect and complete lacking in nothing. Friends, no matter what we're going through, we still have means and cause for continual celebration, which brings me to an eighth and final benefit. An eighth and final benefit in the life of a believer as a result of what comes into our life when we get saved is a perpetual promise. And I close with this. In verse 9, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. One of the greatest aspects of theology the study of God. One of the greatest aspects of soteriology, the study of salvation, is the fact of what we see right here. Just the promise, the perpetual promise about the salvation, the ongoing saving of our souls. Friends, this is the beauty of it. And the reality is this. When a person gets saved, they're always saved. There's nothing that can change that. Once you give your life to Jesus, there's nothing that can change that circumstance. Not everybody believes that. There's some out here that believe that a person, based on the circumstances of their life and things that they do or do not do, can lose their salvation. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says in John 10, 28, that I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. All that the Father, John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. Oh, one of my favorites. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. For I'm convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us from God. Friend, that ought to give you great hope and promise. For some, even encouragement today. 
Because you've been living on the outside of the boundaries. And the old enemy's told you that God no longer wants you. Friend, you're a child of God. And once you give your life in the Master's hands, nothing can take you out. I wonder what this means for you today. I really do. I wonder what this means for you today. How does that look for you this morning? If you're here today, some of you are saved. Some of you are a child of God. I wonder this morning how this sermon speaks to you and the Word of God and what, how it resonates in your life. This ought to be a refreshing. This ought to be a re refueling for your life today. Some of you are saved, but you've been living in an imprisonment and today ought to unshackle. You're a child of God and all of these benefits are yours at your disposal for your earthly use and all of your eternal use. You no longer have to be bound. Some of you here today, you ought to be, listen, you ought to move forward. This ought to enable you to move forward in your journey. Stop being a victim. Some of y'all playing the victim card, you played it for far too long. You're a child of God. Move forward. Some of you today, you never got saved before. And today you heard about these benefits and you're like, man, if that's what comes with salvation, I want that. Guess what? I wouldn't have preached it if I didn't want that for you. And God wouldn't have let me preach it if he didn't want it for you. Why don't you come today and get these benefit package that comes with salvation. Father, help us to make a faith-based decision today in what you want us to do and how you want us to do it. In Jesus' name.